Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, The Problem of Evil, Part 1. Now the subject that we have before us is the problem of evil. There's no doubt of the fact that evil exists and men have always argued about it and wondered about it. H.G. Wells said as he was discussing all of the bombings at the beginning of World War II, either God has the power and does not care, or God cares and does not have the power. But there's a third answer. God has the power. God certainly could destroy Satan tonight. And God cares, but God is doing something else. This problem is an old one. It was at the time of Voltaire and Rousseau that the Lisbon earthquake caused so many people to become atheists. For in the city of Lisbon there was an earthquake and the first shock came and people rushed to the churches for protection. And thousands of people went into the cathedral and the second shock came and killed them all. One of the great disasters of history which caused the atheists in France to say, well if God can't take care of people when they run to his house, how can you expect us to believe in him? There is no doubt of the fact that in all ages men have wondered about this question of evil and the question of sin. Now let's not try to beg the question, does God have all power? Yes, you say. Has God always had all power? Yes. Does God know all things? Yes. Did God create all things? Yes. Did God create Lucifer? Come on now, did God create Lucifer? Yes, of course he did. God created all things, all things. John 1, 1, all things are made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Now Lucifer was perfect when God created him. But now here's the $64,000 question. When God created Lucifer, did he know that he was going to become the devil? Did he know that he was going to become the devil? Come on, have the courage of your convictions. Don't put the burden of it on. Yes, certainly. See, don't put the burden of it on me, because if you sit there and you say, well, I, I'm afraid I'm making something bad for God. Look, God doesn't need you and me to protect him. I'll tell you that. All right, we've now arrived at almost unanimous consent to the fact that God created all things, that God knew all things, that God created Lucifer, and when he created Lucifer, he knew he was going to become the devil. And the last question is this, could he have created him otherwise if he had wanted to? Certainly. All right, then you really believe down deep in your heart when you have the courage to face the question, that God created the being who became evil and that when God created him, he knew he was going to become evil. Now, you have to think very hard on this one. Does that make God responsible for sin? And the answer is no, it does not. God created Lucifer and Lucifer became the devil, but that does not make God responsible for sin. For he created Lucifer as a free moral agent, and iniquity was found in him. In fact, if you will turn to the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28, you have the verse that talks about the origin of sin, and I believe that it is a verse that you should teach to your children when they're very small. Not very long after you teach them John 3.16, you should explain to children that Sin rose in the heart of the devil. Now, in order to understand the passage that I'm going to read to you, you must realize the following fact, that very often in the Bible, God speaks to the devil through a third instrument. In the book of Genesis, he spoke to the devil through the serpent. Because thou hast done this thing, thou art cursed above all cattle. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shall be thy meat. Now he's talking to the serpent, and then he says, And I will put enmity between thee, not the serpent, but Satan, and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
So we find on the first pages of the Bible, God talking to Satan through the serpent. We find God talking to Satan through Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. When Peter spoke words which Satan had put into his throat. And you discover on several other occasions that God addresses Satan in this way. And so it is here in the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28, it says in verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. Now back in verse 1, it said, Take up a lamentation on the prince of Tyre. Now we know from history that Tyre was a principality and had a prince. It did not have a king, an earthly king. But here, after God has spoken to the prince, he speaks to the king of Tyre, and it doesn't take long to see that it's not a man that he's talking to, that it's a power behind the throne, that it's Satan, and that he's talking about how Lucifer became Satan. Say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, literally you're the top of the pyramid, you cap the climax, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now there are a lot of people who are going to get a shock here, you know. Why they say, I thought the devil was ugly, like a dragon, horns, hoofs, and tail. Oh, the devil loves to give that kind of a picture about himself. But that is not the way the Bible sets him forth. But the Bible sets him forth as full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. When God created Lucifer, he was the wisest being that was ever created. He was also the most beautiful. In fact, he's called the angel of light. And then it says in the next verse, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, now how had he been in Eden, the garden of God? Surely the prince of Tyre who lived at the time of Ezekiel had never been in the garden of Eden where Adam was. And then it goes on to describe him in his first creation, in the great palace of jewels that was over him. And then it shows definitely that it's not a man, for in verse 14 it says this, Thou art the anointed cherub that governeth. So definitely it states that this being was not a man, but of the order of cherubs. Now, in order to understand the angelic world, you've got to realize that they're in ranks, like privates, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels, generals, all the way up to Lucifer, the devil, the commander-in-chief. And he was at the top of the heap. And God created these ranks of angels with tremendously differing powers. And at the very top, he put this one who was the anointed cherub that covereth. There are many other translations in other versions. The best would probably be the cherub that was anointed to govern. The great being that was chosen by God to rule the universe as prophet, priest, and king. And this is what he was before he sinned. He was prophet, priest, and king. He was prophet. He spoke for God to the universe. He was priest. He took the worship of the angelic hosts to God. He was king. He ruled over the universe for God. Why, even when Jesus Christ came, he did not deny this to him. But what did he call him? The prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. Now is the prince of this world judge. And when Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ in the temptation in the desert shortly after Christ's baptism, what was it he said? As he took Christ up onto the high mountain, all of these kingdoms, note the three words, all the kingdoms and the power and the glory thereof are mine, and to whom I will I give them. Very interesting. He said, mine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And Jesus went away right up onto the mount with the disciples, and he said, when you pray, say, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. But the devil, very definitely in the temptation, as it is recorded there in Luke, said, mine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's mine. And Jesus knew he was telling the truth, too. It was his, and it still is. We do not know our Bibles if we think that God is running everything in the state capital at Montgomery or at City Hall in Philadelphia, 
or in Washington, D.C., or in Moscow. Let's not forget it. The Bible tells us that the devil still runs human government. You read it in Ephesians chapter 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, the rulers of the darkness of this age. And so God flatly states that the devil rules human government. And that is why we never can expect there to be righteousness until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in the second coming. If righteousness should come by the law, we read in Galatians, Christ is dead in vain. If peace could come by the United Nations, Christ is dead in vain. If man were able to bring peace on this earth, man would be able to say, God, move over, we've done it. We did it all by our little selves and we brought peace on earth to men of ill will. But it is not going to be. And when the second coming of Christ takes place, it will be in the midst of a lost world and a church that has largely grown cold and is lukewarm, of which God says there will be judgment. Now, when we understand this, when we realize that God definitely states here in Ezekiel 28 that this being that he's talking to was Satan, he says in verse 15, and this is the verse I would have you teach your children by heart, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. And there's the verse that tells you where sin began. It began by spontaneous combustion in the heart of Lucifer, of whom God says, Thou wast perfect, for God created the heavens and the earth, and he created Lucifer as the shining, beautiful angel, as an angel of power, as an angel of wisdom, as an angel of beauty, and put him in charge of everything. And thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, how was iniquity found in thee? I think we can see if we look at this and another passage that the answer is very simple. The next verse says, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. What does merchandise mean? Merchandise is anything that a man gives and takes in order to make a profit for himself. The merchandise of a lawyer is his ability to sway judge and jury. The merchandise of a model is her ability to wear an expensive gown so it'll make a rather fat lady think that if she buys that gown, she'll look as nice as the model. The merchandise of a banker is money. The merchandise of a preacher is his ability to stand up in front of sinners and tell them something that they need. God help him if he ever tries to profit by it. That's why it says, never, 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 never let a young convert get up and preach. That's flatly ordered in the Bible. Not a novice, lest being filled with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. For you see, we learn a great deal by that verse which says, don't let a young convert get up and preach. Let him be seasoned. Let him be a year, two years, three years. Oh, don't misunderstand. You can get a young convert up and say, I thank God I was dead, but now I'm alive in Christ. Pray for me. But don't ever, ever, ever take a young convert and say, now you fill the pulpit. He can't do it. He'll get up and blather with the hot air of the flesh, and it will be to the detriment of the people and above all to his own detriment. More young Christians have been hurt by telling them that they're to get up and witness at length than any other thing. God says, again in the epistles, lay hands suddenly on no man. Lay hands means ordain. Lay hands suddenly on no man, and not a young convert, lest being filled with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now look at this. The devil was fresh created. And he looked out over the universe and he said, why, I'm the most wonderful creature in the universe. And there's God, and he was taking all the worship to God, and this was his merchandise, worship. 
He took the worship of the hosts and gave it all to God. And then he took the authority of God and used it to govern. And so he was using the power of God to govern and the worship of the hosts to God. And he became like the teller in a bank who takes money in and out. That's the merchandise of the teller. And the merchandise of the teller, he must never have any of it going in his pocket. The teller in the bank that takes the money, puts a little of it in his pocket, and then takes money and puts a little of it in his pocket, he's soon in great trouble. He's a thief. And that's exactly how the devil sinned. He said, worship goes to God, but I ought to have a little credit for me. I'm wonderful myself. That's why, that's why the devil was so sick to be worshipped by Christ. And in the last of the temptations, it was though he said, God Almighty, I'm so eager to be recognized. I'll give up the fight and stop, Jesus. If just once, Jesus, you'll get down on your knees in front of me and give me the <laughs> pleasure of seeing you recognize that I'm really something. And that was the third temptation of Jesus. It was saying just one little minute, just please tell me I'm beautiful and wonderful. Give me a little credit. Let me tell you this, you're never more like the devil than when you want credit for something you do. You're never more like the devil than when you want to be proud and say, well, that was my idea, I originated that. You're never more like the devil when you want someone to be pleased because you did it. And you're never more like Christ when you say, Lord, it's quite all right, it doesn't make any difference at all who gets the credit, to thee be the glory. Now, you see how this slices right down the middle of everything we do and say and are and brings us face to face with the most tremendous implications of, of the nature of the whole of the problem. For it says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee with violence. And then it says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And God said, I will cast thee as profane to the ground. I will lay thee before kings. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth. And the day is going to come when upon the earth, the devil is going to be reduced to his final littleness. And people are going to see him for what he is. That little phrase, upon the earth, is so important. That's why Jesus Christ said in John 17, Father, I have glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Now, if we want to see how Lucifer became the devil, if we want to see the steps by which it happened, we turn over to Isaiah chapter 14. For in Isaiah 14, we have another one of these paragraphs in divine revelation that speaks of how Lucifer became the devil. I'm going to go back to verse 9 because here is a prophecy of what is going to happen when the devil finally gets to hell. Now, as I say, it's extremely important that we understand that the devil has never been in hell. I would be perfectly safe in offering a reward of $10,000 to anybody who could give me even half a line in the Bible that says that the devil has ever been in hell, that the devil ever ran hell or ever will run hell or ever will have anything to do with the governing of hell or that anybody that ever followed the devil will ever have anything to do with hell. When the devil ultimately gets to hell, he'll be there as the chief victim. And here is the picture of the moment that he arrives. Already there before him are the Caesars, the Hitlers, the Mussolini. Now, the Bible teaches that the dictators are Satan's men and that they're in hell. We don't know how many doctors are in hell. We know the dictators are there. We don't know how many lawyers or school teachers are in hell. We know the dictators are there. We don't know how many merchants or farmers are in hell. We know the dictators are there. There are only two classes of people of whom we know that many of them are in hell. This is one of the most solemn things in the whole Bible. The one class is dictators and the other is preachers. For Jesus in the New Testament said that in that day they'll come to me and say, Lord, haven't we cast out demons in thy name and in thy name done many mighty works? And he will say to them, religious workers, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. 
of the most solemn and humbling things there is in the world. Why, God says it would be better for a man not to be born. It would be better for a Sunday school teacher not to be born. And that a millstone be put around their neck and that they be cast into the depths of the sea than that they misteach one of God's little ones. Now here in Isaiah 14, you have the picture of the dictators having landed in hell. And they're all there waiting for the moment when the devil finally gets there. And I'm going to read it. You know, there are some passages in the Bible, if you just read them in a solemn tone of voice, you're not going to get the meaning. But listen to this now. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth. And the Hebrew word chief ones is the leaders, the dictators. The German translation literally says they're, they're Führer. The Führers, the, the princes, the leaders are stirred up to meet the devil. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee. Now this is what the Hitlers and Mussolinis say to the devil on the day the devil finally arrives in the lake of fire. Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And then God gives you the picture of how sin started. And here's the first sin there ever was in the universe. Before this, there was no sin in the universe. After this, there was sin. Before this, there was only one will, God's will. And then there came two wills, and there was sin. God's will and the devil's will. Because the beginning of sin was at the beginning of a second will. 